Tonight, the U.S. taking a major step in Gaza. Aid flowing to Gaza is nowhere nearly enough. We won't stand by and let until they until we get more aid in there. A day after more than 100 Palestinians were killed during a chaotic encounter with Israeli troops, President Biden announcing the U.S. will begin dropping humanitarian aid into Gaza, a first in the months-long war that has seen more than 30,000 Gazans killed. We'll have more from the ground. Plus, closing arguments wrap up in the bid to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis from prosecuting Donald Trump's election interference case. The dramatic moments and what it could mean for the former president's major legal trial. And... También ellas me enseñaban al final del camino que si era verdad, que si era cierto, que cualquier mujer queriendo hacer las cosas lo puede hacer. And on this first day of Women's History Month, we take you to the only female-owned and fully operated tequila distillery in Jalisco, Mexico, and meet the women bringing the, quote, elixir of the gods to life. And good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin this Friday night with a new discovery off the coast of Alaska. A fisherman finding debris has reported it to the FBI. It could be another spy balloon. Let's get straight to Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas with the details just coming in. Tonight, the FBI investigating reports of another possible spy balloon flying in U.S. airspace. The FBI becoming involved after fishermen discovered a concerning object off the coast of Alaska. According to sources, the fishermen suspect it might be some kind of surveillance balloon. But tonight, the FBI is describing the unknown object as debris. Sources telling ABC News the FBI and other agencies will assess the object when it makes its way to shore this weekend, determining what, if anything, should be done next, including whether it will be flown to a government facility for further analysis. Just last week over Colorado, NORAD sending up fighter jets to intercept a high-altitude balloon flying at 43,000 to 45,000 feet. It was determined not to be a threat to national security, but President Biden and the White House tracking the balloon's course. The administration keenly aware of such incidents coming just a year after a Chinese spy balloon was spotted flying clear across the country. President Biden ordering it shot down off the coast of South Carolina. It's payload alone, the size of three buses. Pierre joins me now. Pierre, why such a quick response to this? So you're seeing such a rapid response in part because of that massive Chinese spy balloon recovered last year, which we're told had expansive surveillance capabilities. These matters are now treated seriously until an assessment can be made one way or another, period, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. No taking chances. Pierre Thomas, thanks. Pleasure. Next tonight to the former president and major news involving the future of two of his trials. In this classified documents case at Mar-a-Lago, the special counsel, Jack Smith, argued there is no rule that says the trial cannot be conducted in the weeks before the election. And in Georgia tonight, we may be closer to finding out whether D.A. Fonnie Willis will be able to stay on the case. Aaron Katursky reports from Florida. To the cheers of his supporters, Donald Trump arrived at a Florida court hoping to convince a judge to push the federal trial over his alleged mishandling of classified documents past the November election. For the first time in nearly two months, Trump coming face to face with special counsel Jack Smith, the two adversaries appearing to lock eyes several times. Trump's attorney argued holding a trial before the election is a mistake and should not happen. He asked Judge Aileen Cannon, who Trump appointed, to push the case until late November so the former president isn't stuck in a courtroom when he could be campaigning. Prosecutors responding this case can be tried this summer, accusing Trump of trying to wring out of the court needless hearings meant to delay. And they argued holding the trial before the vote would not violate the Justice Department's policy against bringing politically charged cases within 60 days of an election. They say that policy only applies to bringing an indictment. But in this case, a lengthy investigation is long complete and the charges laid out. So a trial can go forward. Prosecutors telling the judge, we are in full compliance with the Justice Department manual. Judge Cannon did not issue a ruling today. In a Georgia courtroom, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who was prosecuting the former president for election interference, sitting silently. Trump's lawyer arguing she should be disqualified because of her romance with one of her prosecutors, Nathan Wade. Now, do you have to find that Wade and Willis lied? No. What you need to be able to find is that there is a concern, a legitimate concern based on the evidence in this case about their truthfulness. 
The district attorney's office arguing Willis's relationship with Wade did not infringe on Trump or his 18 co-defendants' rights to a fair trial. Not a single shred of evidence was produced through any of the exhibits or the witness testimony showing how their constitutional rights, their due process rights, were all, were at all affected. Aaron joins us now from Florida. Aaron, what are the timelines on both of these cases? So, Phil, the judge in Atlanta said he would rule within the next two weeks. Here in Florida, Judge Cannon gave us no indication when she would set a new trial date for Donald Trump. But again, the prosecutors are arguing there is no need for her to wait until after the election because their investigation is long complete and holding a trial would not run afoul of Justice Department policy. Phil? We'll be waiting. Aaron Katursky, thank you. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and members of her team now have two weeks before they can expect the judge overseeing the case to issue his ruling after final arguments were heard today. It's been weeks of courtroom drama after Donald Trump's legal team sought to disqualify Willis over a personal relationship she's had with one of her prosecutors. But will his team be successful here? ABC's Olivia Rubin joins us now from Georgia. Olivia, the judge said he could rule sometime in the coming weeks, but re regardless of a ruling, really any delay here is sort of a win for Trump in the short term, right? Absolutely. Even if she doesn't get kicked off of the case, Donald Trump has scored some wins here in Fulton County, specifically politically, because even if she is not off the case, think Phil, about everything that has come out about the district attorney in these weeks of hearings in Georgia. Uh, you know, issues about her relationship, issues about trips taken, issues about the district attorney's sex life have been aired out for everyone to see. And those are political wins that Donald Trump can take out with him on the campaign trail and give him some ammunition that he needs to say, hey, the cases against me are flawed, which is really what he's looking for. And I would also point out that another defense attorney who's been working on the case pointed out to me, even if the district attorney survives this effort, this is something that won't necessarily go away. Donald Trump and the other defendants can still bring up this issue as the case moves along, even in front of jurors at a potential trial, Phil. So even if they lose this effort, this motion to disqualify the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, still some political points scored for them for sure. So then play this out for us just a little bit. If the DA is disqualified, what happens? Does the case go away with it or does the case continue with someone else? It absolutely does not go away. That's exactly right. The case would continue with someone else. There's this independent body here in Georgia that would get the assignment of finding a new prosecutor and assigning them to this case. But the only hiccup with that, it becomes the timing of it all. Remember, Donald Trump does not want this case to go to trial before the election in November. So the question is, can this independent body find a new prosecutor quickly enough to pick up the case, get read right up to speed, and then hopefully in their view, bring it before trial. That is a tall order. But remember, even if she does stay on the case, she has requested a trial date of August 5th, and that still has not been set. So regardless if she stays on or off, the question is still up in the air on whether or not this case will go to trial before the election, though the district attorney, Fonnie Willis, has certainly made clear that is absolutely her goal, Phil. All right, Olivia Rubin from Fulton County, Georgia. Olivia, thank you. Joining us for more on both of these cases now, ABC News contributor Ashana Lloyd. Ashana, a little free legal advice. We can get into these. Thanks for taking the time. Um, so we'll start in Georgia. What happens uh, realistically if Fonnie Willis is disqualified from the case? Listen, Phil, that's a win because what it does is we're talking about extreme delay. They have to find another prosecutor who will take the case. That prosecutor has to be brought up to speed. This case has been worked for two and a half years. That is a lot of information. So the other thing that could happen, too, is if they do find a new prosecutor, they are appointed, they get caught up to speed, they could actually reduce the indictment to it in an attempt to streamline this case. So we could see a lot of changes in this case if we have a new prosecutor are appointed. But whatever happens in the interim, we've, we've been focused on Fonnie Willis's behavior, not the behavior of the person she's prosecuting. So it's sort of a, a win in the short term. Um, let's turn to the classified documents case. Um, do you think the Supreme Court's decision uh, to hear Trump's immunity claim will have an effect on the case? 
You know, Phil, I don't see that having an effect. And the reason is the Supreme Court is looking at immunity while you're a sitting president. By all reports, these documents left the White House after former President Trump was no longer a president. Therefore, that should not stop this case from moving forward. Anything from the court proceedings today that really stuck out to you? You know, everything about this has been unusual, Phil. Uh, right. You know, looking at this, hearing these closing statements, I mean, the idea that we're having this trial against a district attorney in and of itself is amazing. Um, but what I really saw is that, you know, the court is very careful about impropriety. So we could see this judge just make a determination that the fact that there has been all of these allegations, that there was a relationship, that that is enough to have her disqualified. So we really could see the justice system try to stay above the fray. How difficult do you think it is for Trump as a defendant to balance all these cases uh, with his at attorneys, because it is multiple attorneys in multiple cases? It's a lot of information that the legal teams are dealing with. It's going to be hard for him to get all of this information together. However, the courts will respect other courts' dates. So that's another factor that we're not considering when we talk about delays. If there is one trial going on, he cannot be requested to come to another trial. So we may see additional delays just due to the docket and who dockets their trial first. And finally, many thought that uh, the former president was going to be spending the entire election season in a courtroom. Uh, it's possible none of these trials would actually go ahead of the November election, right? Absolutely. I mean, when we talk about the Supreme Court decision, if they decide that he has immunity, that entire trial will go to go to the wayside. You can't prosecute him if that's what the Supreme Court makes a decision on. When we talk about the Fannie Willis case, should another prosecutor come in and reduce the indictment, we could be looking at something very short. They may find someone who says, as a matter of fact, we don't find that there should be an indictment. So it's almost like starting from scratch. So we could see a number of these court cases cases dissipate before the election, depending on how these things play out. Oh, and so it continues. Shauna Lloyd, thanks so much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Always good to see you. Great to see you, Phil. On to Gaza tonight, President Biden announcing the U.S. will begin airdropping food and supplies into the Strip. It comes a day after that horrific scene, a deadly stampede and Israeli gunfire as trucks were arriving. Tom Sufi Burridge in the region tonight. Just 24 hours after the Israeli military opened fire amid a deadly crush of people desperate for food aid in Gaza, President Biden tonight announcing the U.S. will begin airdropping supplies into the Gaza Strip. People are so desperate that uh, uh, innocent people got caught in a terrible war, unable to feed their families, and you saw the response when they tried to get aid in. With half a million Gazans on the brink of famine, the U.N. saying at least 10 children have starved to death. Jordan and other countries already airdropping aid. The president acknowledging not enough is getting in. Innocent lives are on the line and children's lives are on the line. Tonight, condemnation and calls for an investigation into what was supposed to be a humanitarian mission in northern Gaza, when more than 100 Palestinians were killed and hundreds more injured, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. This is the moment gunfire erupted. Israel saying its troops fired warning shots and only opened fire on people when they got too close to one of their tanks, adding dozens of people were crushed to death in the chaos. But survivors and witnesses disputing that. Abdullah Juha recounting the horror, saying they attacked us, they shot at us. We don't have any food. And food, obviously, a top concern there right now. Tom joins us. Uh, Tom, how soon can these airdrops by the U.S. begin? Yeah, Phil, a U.S. official telling ABC News the humanitarian aid drops could start as soon as tomorrow, depending on weather conditions. President Biden saying the administration is also looking into ways to deliver aid by sea. Phil? Tom Sufi Burridge from Tel Aviv tonight. Tom, thank you. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was laid to rest today in Moscow. It was an emotional scene inside the church, a traditional Orthodox service, two weeks after Navalny's mysterious death at a remote Russian prison. Security forces keeping a, a watchful eye, to say the least. James Longman with our report. Tonight, they turned out by the thousands. <laughs> Russians braving Putin's security state to mourn opposition icon Alexei Navalny. We weren't afraid. We are not afraid either, they chanted as Navalny's coffin arrived at this suburban Moscow church. 
Putin will be Others in the crowd shouting, Putin is a killer, blaming the Russian leader for Navalny's death in an Arctic prison two weeks ago. The line around the block well over a mile long. And inside the church, Navalny's open casket allowing mourners to say goodbye to the man whose ideals they hope they can keep alive. His parents looking on at their son, his body covered in roses. Later at the cemetery, his mother giving him a final kiss goodbye. The 47-year-old was buried to Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. And music from his favorite movie, Terminator 2, a last joke said to be typical of his humor. It was largely a peaceful day. At least 90 arrests reported so far at commemorations across the country. But Putin's eyes are everywhere in Russia, and recriminations may yet come. And tonight, in an emotional tribute, his wife Yulia posting, Thank you for 26 years of absolute happiness. I will try to make you proud. James is with us now. James, what more are we learning about the scene there at Navalny's burial? Well, Phil, I think it's worth reiterating the kinds of people who turned up today. I mean, remember, uh, Putin called uh, Alexei Navalny an extremist, an enemy of the state, and yet all people from all walks of life appeared outside uh, this funeral, including uh, elderly women clapping. I mean, they would constitute part of Putin's base in as much as a base would exist in Russia. Uh, so they stayed outside. They chanted well after the cemetery had closed just a few hours ago, chanting his name, calling him Russia's hero. Phil? Yeah, an act of courage just to be there. James Longman, thank you. A massive life-threatening storm hitting California at this hour, then moving into Nevada and Colorado. Parts of the Sierra Nevada mountains expected to see an incredible 12 feet of snow. Wind gusts over 70 miles an hour. Even ski slopes, it's too much for them. They're shutting down. Yosemite National Park also closing to visitors. And the rain, torrential at lower elevations. Our Faith Abube is in Truckee, California. Tonight, rare blizzard warnings for the Sierra Nevada mountains as the biggest storm of the winter slams California with up to 12 feet of snow, life-threatening conditions and impossible travel in the mountains. Some of our highest peaks have seen winds in excess of 140 miles per hour, so this storm is just a monster. Officials in Truckee warning. We get a lot of snow. Uh, but we don't get blizzard conditions. We don't get conditions where if somebody were to walk out of their house down to the street, be completely disoriented and not know how to get back to their house. The worst of the conditions expected tonight through Saturday. Nightmarish travel already along Interstate 80 in Soda Springs. The Highway Patrol posting this video showing vehicles stuck in the whiteout over Donner Summit. The avalanche danger increasing with snowfall rates of up to five inches an hour. The high winds relentless. This is what officials are worried about. You can see the tree down on this house. Fortunately, though, no one was injured in this incident. Multiple ski resorts forced to close. The National Park Service even shutting down Yosemite to visitors. And they don't take a decision like that lightly. Faith joins us now from Truckee, California. Conditions there, as we can see behind you, Faith, already pretty bad. What are officials telling you? Well, Phil, conditions here are deteriorating so fast that highway officials are stopping every single vehicle except for four-wheel drives in order to make sure they have traction devices or chains installed on their tires. They're also warning families up and down the mountain areas to make sure that they have enough supplies because they could possibly be stuck there for several days after the storm. Phil? All right. Faith Abube from Truckee, California. Faith, thank you. To the Texas Panhandle now, where firefighters are racing to contain the largest wildfire in that state's history with fire alert conditions on the way this weekend. The Smokehouse Creek fire is now up to 15% contained as strong winds and higher temperatures return. More than a million acres have burned much of Canadian Texas it is now charred. It's a charred landscape, as you see there. At least two people are reported to have died in that fire. Michelle Traconis, who stood trial in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, her live-in boyfriend's estranged wife, has been found guilty on all counts. Traconis was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder, tampering with physical evidence, conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence, and also hindering prosecution. Jennifer Dulos, a Connecticut mother of five, disappeared in May of 2019 during a custody dispute with her estranged husband, Fotis Dulos, her body has never been found, but a judge has declared her legally dead. 
There is a desperate search tonight for two people seen in pretty chilling surveillance video uh, showing a possible abduction in Buckeye, Arizona. Take a look at this. You can see the car pull up to a gas pump. After a woman gets out and starts to run toward the store, the driver then drags her back in, pushes her back inside. The man then jumps into the car and speeds off toward the interstate. Police still don't know if this could have been a domestic argument of some sort, but they say their primary goal is to find this woman and make sure she's okay. Walgreens and CVS say they will soon begin dispensing the abortion pill mifepristone in some states where it is legal. The move could make it easier for some patients to access the drug, which is the most common form of abortion in the U.S. The decision is directly tied to the new rules issued by the FDA for dispensing mifepristone, which are being challenged by anti-abortion groups before the Supreme Court. The University of Florida has eliminated all diversity, equity, and inclusion or DEI positions at the university, according to an administrative memo that was released today. The memo cites a recent state ban on the use of public funds for diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, activities and policies, as well as activities for, quote, political or social activism in the public college system. The Florida Board of Governors passed this restriction in January shortly after the Florida Board of Education passed a similar ban. Uh, joining me now to discuss a little bit more about this is the director of the African American Studies Program and professor at the University of Florida, David Canton. Uh, professor, thank you for joining us. Florida Governor DeSantis has reacted to this decision uh, by your university. He said this on X, formerly known as Twitter, DEI is toxic and has no place in our public universities. I'm glad that Florida was the first state to eliminate DEI, and I hope more states follow suit. So right off the bat, first question, your reaction to that? Well, obviously, people just tend to disagree, right? I think um, diversity, equity, inclusion got its start in 2015 after the murder of Michael, uh, uh, Mike Brown, and that institutions, universities, corporate America, you know, started to, to address institutional or systemic inequality. Then we saw it again after George Floyd in 2020. I just think for people uh, who disagreed, argue that these programs created reverse racism, per, 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 preferential treatment. But again, we look at the data in terms of, uh, of race and class and gender, you still see inequities when we look at the numbers. I think oftentimes, you know, people don't use data to back up their, their uh, positions. Are you or other colleagues who are in similar positions to yours at the university concerned about your job security? Well, African American studies is an academic discipline, just like women's studies, Latin America. So these are academic disciplines, just like history, philosophy, economics. So obviously, we're an academic discipline. We're teaching students skills of research, critical thinking, writing. So, you know, our programs are, real, are safe. You know, now some people might think they're not, but again, we're an academic discipline. We're not out here indoctrinating students, encouraging them to become social activists. We're here to teach them these critical thinking skills, how to evaluate evidence and make sound uh, academic uh, uh, choices. Have you talked to colleagues at other institutions who perhaps are concerned about their jobs who are not an academic discipline? Uh, so far, I haven't received any texts or emails as of yet. Obviously, it, it happened on a Friday at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I guess on when Monday hits, you know, people reach out, whether it's in universities, or corporate America, obviously might have a ripple effect, but we shall see the next couple of weeks. What do you think about the decision as a whole? Do you think it makes a university better or worse off? Great question. I think, uh, you know, America is a multiracial democracy. We see California, 80% of public school children are non-white. The reality is we have to educate all Americans on this, this historical demographic reality. So I think any efforts used to educate and inform and expose people to multiple perspectives about multiple, multiple, multiple culture, about race, only benefits the country so people can make informed decisions rather than make uh, decisions based on fear or ignorance. All right, David Canton from the University of Florida tonight. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great night. You too.
And there is still much more to get to here on Prime. A man who shot and killed a woman in a car that turned around in his driveway while looking for another house is sentenced. But first, in our Prime Focus, it's a type of liquor you're probably familiar with, but one company is taking a different approach to how it's made. We travel to Mexico to see the property where a fast-growing tequila is being made solely by women. El tequila es algo muy mexicano y realmente más que vender tequila yo siento como que agarro un poquito de tierra y la pongo en el tequila, un poquito del corazón de las mujeres, de nuestras costumbres, de todo y lo meto en el tequila. Para mí las mujeres tienen magia también. Si yo te digo que el tequila es un elixir de los dioses, yo te puedo decir que las mujeres son la inspiración de los dioses. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. It is an agave-based libation slowly and smoothly making its way to overtake vodka as the best-selling liquor in the entire U.S. We're talking about tequila. So to kick off this first day of Women's History Month in tonight's prime focus, ABC's Maria Villarreal heads to Mexico where she meets the exceptional legend behind the only tequila made exclusively by women. <laughs> El que crean en ti es importante. Hay muchas que tienen una vida difícil y que yo les digo aquí, tú puedes, tú eres, tú haces, porque realmente todo, todo el poder, todo lo tienen ellas. In traditional Mexican households, women are revered as mothers, teachers and caregivers who always stay close to home. Men are still the breadwinners, the decision makers, and the success stories, but not here. Of the nearly 140 distilleries in Mexico, this is the only one led and operated solely by women. La energía de la mujer es diferente. Es la energía de cada una de las chicas que tienen una ilusión, que tienen un pensamiento, un sueño, que lo vierten en el tequila. Nestled near Valle de Guadalupe in the state of Jalisco, Mexico, is where Meli Barajas built her distillery from the ground up. Toda esta locura empezó por el amor a mi papá. Una tarde, 
estuve platicando con mi papá y me comentó que quería un tequila. Entonces, ya sabes, mi papá era mi héroe, era mi príncipe azul y cómo no hacerle un regalo a él. When that conversation happened more than 20 years ago, Melly was on her way to becoming a fashion designer. Yo tenía como 20 años, ni siquiera tomaba tequila. Jamás me imaginé o pensé verme moliendo, este, gimando en el sol, viendo las plantas. Melly's journey was far from being as smooth as the tequila she was creating. Early on being hit with a shot of reality. Las predicciones de todo mundo era que no iba a durar ni seis meses en el negocio. Quería entrar a un mundo de hombres, de personas que tenían abuelos, tatarabuelos, que tenían ya una tradición. The relationship between a father and a daughter is very special. And I can only imagine that is why you wanted to do this for your father. Y yo al querer darle un regalo a él, realmente él fue el que me lo dio a mí. Murió él, no pudo conocer su tequila, no pudo conocer esto, pero en el cielo, lo vi. Little by little, Melly created one of the purest blue agave tequilas Mexico has ever seen. The magic and the motivation to keep going coming from the most unexpected place. Realmente, cuando abrí las puertas para hacer entrevistas, llegaron puras mujeres. Tengo mamás solteras, tengo mujeres que quieren salir del pueblo, que quieren ser diferentes. A mí me motivan ellas, viendo la motivación que ellas tienen para seguir adelante, para sobrevivir. A demanding job in an industry still ruled by men. What happened inside this factory is beyond unique. Melly became the so-called Reina de Tequila, Queen of Tequila, an army of warriors by her side helping create Leyenda de México. And this is where it all begins, Los Altos de Jalisco. The rich soil and favorable weather conditions make this part of Mexico the perfect breeding ground for rows and rows of blue agave. The company doesn't use a drop of pesticide or fertilizer on their crops. From farm to factory, these agave bulbs can weigh upwards of 55 pounds. An assembly line of women heave the bulbs into a gigantic masonry oven where they are roasted. The inside turns soft, releasing the sweet juices of the plant, the main ingredient of tequila. En esta área estamos en la fermentación. 24 hours later, the juice is sent to one of the storage tanks sitting right in the middle of the plant, each fermenting tequila at different stages out in the open. Nuestra fermentación dura a veces 5, 10, hasta 12 días, yeah. más o menos, porque no ponemos nada de químicos, solo la, la naturaleza. Pero la idea es de hacerlo como los abuelos lo hacían. Esto es para jalar el olor. Un poquito de hierbabuena. Aquí un poquito de limón. Sí, un poco de limón. Sí, agarra, agárralo, 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 así. El tequila es algo muy mexicano. Y realmente, más que vender tequila, yo siento como que agarro un poquito de tierra y la pongo en el tequila, un poquito del corazón de las mujeres, de nuestras costumbres, de todo, y lo meto en el tequila. Para mí las mujeres tienen magia también. Si yo te digo que el tequila es un elixir de los dioses, yo te puedo decir que las mujeres son la inspiración de los dioses. Teenagers and grandmothers working cohesively to make one of Mexico's few artisanal tequilas. Cuando yo era joven, yo pensaba que no más iba a ser ama de casa, que me iba a casar y no más iba a estar en, a, en casa. Aida Carvajal Rubalcaba is a mother of five and a grandmother of seven. She took her first job at this factory nine years ago, going from gardener to security manager. Siempre me ha apoyado. En cualquier cosa, en cualquier enfermedad, siempre está preocupada por uno o por mí, simplemente. ¿Y cómo te sientes? Muy bien, muy gracias a ella, he salido muy adelante. 
¿Es su amiga? Sí. Yo puedo platicarle algún problema y ella me apoya mucho. A single mother of two young children, Sandra started as a seasonal worker, insecure about her skills and future at the factory. Yo no recuerdo qué estaba haciendo allá afuera y llega la señora Meli y se me pone a un lado y me dice, Sandra, necesito platicar contigo. Y yo, pues ya se acabó el trabajo, <laughs> ya que... Y ya me dice, pues, ¿qué haces? ¿Estudias? ¿Qué vas a hacer saliendo de aquí? Y yo, y yo no, nada. Ah, pues, quédate con nosotros. ¿Qué onda? Te pones la camiseta y que, pues, eres un muy buen elemento. Sandra didn't finish school or attend college. But here, Melly started teaching her new things and giving her more responsibilities. Fast forward seven years, and today she's head chemist of the factory. Y yo pienso que es lo que la hace especial, que, que ha batallado y, y pues nos ha ayudado a, a aprender un montón y, y a nunca rendirnos, a decirnos que todo podemos hacer. About 300,000 agave plants, more than 1,300 gallons of tequila made every day, six different brands, four of them owned by Meli, sold in multiple U.S. states and even Canada. It's award-winning tequila with the aroma of a woman. También ellas me enseñaban al final del camino que si era verdad, que si era cierto que cualquier mujer queriendo hacer las cosas lo puede hacer. A mí me gustaría dejar un legado que, que fuera el que las mujeres se sintieran capaces y quisieran los sueños que tienen. Para mí eso es maravilloso. No sé si sea un legado que pueda perdurar pero yo estoy haciendo lo que debo de hacer, lo que creo que puedo hacer. A wonderful legacy, a wonderful business, and a great product as well. Still ahead here on Prime, from sitcom creator to best-selling author, my conversation with Phil Rosenthal about how he's inspiring kids to broaden their horizons when it comes to food. But first, so often it's women driving the American economy, dictating what's popular and in demand. We're taking a look at this she economy by the numbers. What does it take? to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is Sir Combat Operations Center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Their reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not okay, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For non-stop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler, too. 
only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. me. Reporting from the scene of the subway shooting in the Bronx, I'm Trevor Alt. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. March is Women's History Month, so there's no better time than now to highlight how it's often women driving the American economy to greater heights. Let's call it the she economy in tonight's By the Numbers. Women-owned businesses saw a 17% increase in new openings in 2023. That's according to data from Yelp. There was a 44% increase in women-owned hotels and travel-related businesses, making that the number one sector of growth for women. On the bookshelves, female authors accounted for seven of the 10 best-selling new books in the past year. Top city for women opening new businesses, Austin, Texas, seeing a 34% jump in women-owned businesses this year alone, again, according to Yelp. And for the first time in eight years, female employment in 2023 remained below male unemployment for every single month of the year. Still, women earn only 82 cents on the dollar compared to men, a number that's been flat for the last 20 years. That's according to Pew Research. Sociologists and economists predict the earning power of women in the U.S. will only continue to grow. A prime reason, women continue to earn college degrees at a higher rate than men do. There is much more ahead here tonight on Prime. We are on the road to the Oscars. Our Lindsay Davis sits down with Past Lives director and screenwriter Celine Song to talk about the complexities of a love triangle and how not everything is as it seems. I think about the two men as like, well, they both hold a key to this woman uh, and her identity and her life and her soul that the other guy doesn't have. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
whenever, wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes fall up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back. This week's 2020 is titled Killer on Campus. It's the tragic tale of Christian Aguilar. Born in Miami to Colombian parents, Christian earned a scholarship to his dream school, the University of Florida. Once there, he reconnects with a former classmate and falls in love. But only a few weeks into the semester, he vanishes, leaving the UF campus on edge and his parents obviously in a panic as they frantically search for their missing son. University of Florida freshman Christian Aguilar has not been found. Police say time may be running out. He was on top of the world. Doing so well in school. He has a girlfriend. Everything seems perfect. In one second, everything was gone. 2020 unravels the complex web of lies. This doesn't make any sense. Obsession. What really happened? And cold-blooded murder. Your friends dating your ex-girlfriend. Did he kill his best friend? over a woman they both loved? It was just mind-blowing. The young man on trial for allegedly killing his best friend. You've been in prison for murder of your best friend. Now you're speaking out for the first time. Why? Killer on Campus, the true crime event. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, now streaming on Hulu. Yeah, and as you just heard, you can catch that on Hulu tomorrow. Meantime, a New York man who shot and killed a woman in a car that turned into his driveway has been sentenced to 25 years to life in prison for her murder. Kevin Monaghan killed 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis when she and her friends pulled into his long driveway in rural New York last spring. Police say Gillis and her friends were looking for another friend's house when the shooting occurred. He made a name for himself as the creator of the classic sitcom Everybody Loves Raymond and since has become a best-selling author while also garnering an audience as he travels the world forging connections through food, living by his golden rule to try everything at least once. Phil Rosenthal joins us now in studio to discuss his effort to encourage kids to do the same. We'll start with the book. This book co-authored by your 26-year-old daughter now. Yeah. It's called Just Try It. Yes. Um, why did you guys do this book together? My daughter texts me. She goes, you know, kids love the show, and you're good with the kids. Why don't you do a kid's book? And I said, of course I would, if you do it with me. Ooh. And so it's loosely based on our life. Uh, it's about a dad who <laughs> eats everything and his little girl who won't try anything. Won't try anything. Yeah. And we were talking just before we started the interview that you said your wife did the same thing my wife did. Literally the same word. She used to say to the kids, a no thank you bite. Yes. It's genius, is it not? Take I a no thank so. you bite. Yes. This way the kid gets to assert their personhood and That's authority right. and identity by saying no thank you, That's but right. they're still getting the bite. They're still tasting it. Yeah, and I don't know if it's, I think 60% of the time in my household, they liked what they tasted. Most things are good. With your first book that went all the way to the New York Times, we then come to this book. Yeah. Why a children's book this time? Why, Why not? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great I, question, I, listen, too. Listen, just try it. 
I don't think is just for kids. I meet a lot of grown-ups who don't want to try stuff. No, we just, and, and just try just means have a little bit of an open mind. And I always say, if you can open a mouth, you can open a mind. The food and my stupid sense of humor is just to get you in, to get you to travel, because I think the world would be better if we all could experience a little bit of other people's experiences. Well, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, Somebody Feed Phil, it's yes. called, just dropped on Netflix. Audiences are being taken all over the world by you, seeing new food. Let's, yeah. let's take a look. Oh. Uh, 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 porchetta. <laughs> Are you ready, Phil? <laughs> Wowie, wow, wow. I'm not worthy. I think one of the best things about the, the, the season and the show is your excitement for food. Just, just seeing your enthusiasm over whatever food you're trying, I think is infectious. Um, well, has that always been? No, my, my parents were not uh, chefs. They were not <laughs> even great cooks. I used to say, uh, in our house, meat was a punishment because it was kind of overdone and gray and, and not very good. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I had a good piece of meat. And that's, the, see, I asked for mine well done. <laughs> yes, still? <laughs> still, yeah, I told you, still, this book is for me. Phil, just right. try just it. Just try it, literally, yes. Phil, just yes. try it. <laughs> um, all right, so you've gone all over the place. I have. Seven seasons now. Yeah. I, I'm sure you get asked this question all the time. I'm going to ask it anyways. Do yeah. you have a favorite? And yeah. has anything jumped out uh, at you as something you didn't think you were going to like that you did? Oh, yeah. So Italy is my favorite, mm. maybe because it's one of the first places I ever went in my 20s. And uh, you ever go somewhere and you feel like you, it's awesome, but you also are comfortable? Italy remains the favorite because everywhere you look is spectacular. Every bite of food is delicious. And everybody's hugging and kissing you. So what's not to like? Surrounding the food. It, yes, it's great. And every part of it is great. Uh, a thing I didn't think I would like, mm. I tried an ant Ooh. in Tokyo. They told me this ant tastes like lemon, and I did it. It took all the courage I could muster to bite down and say, damn, if it wasn't like someone dropped a lemon on my tongue. So now I'm asking, well, did you base these in lemon? What yeah. happened? These particular ants, not all ants, this one, in this part of the forest, in this part of Japan, these taste like lemon, which leads to the question, who found this out? <laughs> who tasted all the ants? For the first time, right. Why does this ant the taste lemonade. like lemon? Yes. Amazing. Yes. Would you Amazing. do it again? Would you eat them again? I would eat that one again that if one I again. knew it was the... Now, am I going and looking on the menu, the first thing I'm looking for is bugs? No. Lemon ants? No. No. But, but you did. It was, it was surprisingly great. Phil, you just tried it. Exactly right. Bottle to live by. That's it. You can stream all episodes of Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix and be sure to grab Just Try It, available March 5th, wherever books are sold. Childhood sweethearts reunite years later, and one of them is married. It sounds like a tale that's played out in other films, but past lives director and screenwriter Celine Song says it shouldn't be confused with what you've seen before. Here's ABC News Live prime anchor Lindsay Davis. So how did you find out that you were nominated? Well, I was still in bed and I saw that we had the laptop set up and we we're just laying there just like watching the live feed. And I just found out at the same time everybody else did, which is just on a live broadcast, yeah. Your reaction? <laughs> Oh my God, I was freaking out. I was like shouting and I was immediately calling people. Like, I don't even know which order that I called everyone. It was just like a complete, a joyous burst of energy, I think. There's a word in Korean, inyon. It means providence or fate. Do you believe in that? That's just something Koreans say to seduce someone. And this is somewhat autobiographical, yeah. right? Tell mm -hmm. us about how you, your personal story impacted this movie. Well, it was really inspired by this one moment in my own life where I was sitting there uh, between my childhood sweetheart, who's now a friend who's come to visit me in New York, and my husband that I live with in New York. <laughs> You're uh, in an East Village bar. Right? Yeah, in a East Village bar. And, in, and we were just sitting there, and we were just having a drink, and I was translating between these two people. And uh, I, was, I realized that I'm not just translating between two different cultures and two different languages, but also between two different different parts of my own self and my own history. What a good story this is. Childhood sweethearts who reconnect 20 years later and realize they were meant for each other.
the story, I would be the evil white American husband standing in the way of destiny. Shut up. He was just this kid in my head for such a long time. I think I just missed him. Did he miss you? His home! Wow, Tota. One thing that I love that you've said, you put it, that the villain in this story is not the other person, it's it's time and space. Yes, it's the 24 years that pass, and it's also the Pacific Ocean that she crosses, because she's an immigrant, you know? And I think that the truth is that how uh, we can also feel connected uh, universally to that feeling, because maybe you didn't cross the Pacific Ocean in a new language to be where you are now, but we can all relate to the feeling that, you know, you and I are not 12 anymore, but we were 12 once. And there's a part of us that is 12 still, right? And there's a part of us that is no longer 12. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can all relate to. The guy flew 13 hours to be here. I'm not gonna tell you that you can't see him or something. I read that it was described as not a love triangle, which is typically how we view movies, yeah. but a, a love circle. Yeah. How do you explain that? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, part of uh, the way that these two men love her mm -hmm. is about uh, letting the other person exist in her life. So I think in that way, it is not a love triangle. It is really about these three people that we know are children on some level, and they're children inside, because we meet them as children. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really about the three of them uh, trying to uh, behave like adults. I think about the two men as like, well, they both hold a key to this woman uh, and her identity and her life and her soul that the other guy doesn't have. When we talk about love, so your first love was writing screenplays. Now this was your first time directing, yeah. and you won't look back. You know, actually, my first love, I would say, was playwriting. Mm. It was in theater, and then I did that for 10 years, and I think that now um, it's more like I fell in love with cinema. I remember coming home and telling my husband that, like, I think I met the love of my life, and I think it's filmmaking, and I think I'm going to do this till I'm... Uh, until uh, I'm on my deathbed. This is something that I want to do forever, you know? So it's, yeah, it is completely about like finding the love of your life. Our thanks to Lindsay for that conversation and be sure to catch our brand new special Road to the Oscars featuring all of our conversations with the 2024 Oscar nominees tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and streaming on Hulu. Also, a tune in to Countdown to Oscars on the Red Carpet Live. Wick Johnson and Lindsay Davis will be hosting, featuring the biggest stars and nominees. That is Sunday, March 10th. Coverage begins at 1 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, as the humanitarian crisis in Sudan deepens, the United Nations now says some of what's happening there could amount to war crimes. Plus, a chilling video shows a possible abduction, the desperate search for the woman seen here being grabbed by a man and forced into a car. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. The Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Good evening. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We do have a lot of news to get to on this Friday night, including the new discovery off the coast of Alaska that could potentially be yet another spy balloon. Plus, closing arguments wrap up in the bid to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis from prosecuting Donald Trump's election interference case, the dramatic moments, and what it could mean for the former president's major legal trial, and the sharp spike in wildfires in Brazil and the group now being threatened. But we are going to begin tonight with the former president and major news involving the future of two of his trials. In the classified documents case at Mar-a-Lago, the special counsel Jack Smith argued there is no rule that says the trial cannot be conducted in the weeks just before the election. And in Georgia tonight, we may be a bit closer to finding out whether D.A. Fonnie Willis will stay on that case. Aaron Katursky reports in from Florida. To the cheers of his supporters, Donald Trump arrived at a Florida court hoping to convince a judge to push the federal trial over his alleged mishandling of classified documents past the November election. For the first time in nearly two months, Trump coming face to face with special counsel Jack Smith, the two adversaries appearing to lock eyes several times. Trump's attorney argued holding a trial before the election is a mistake and should not happen. He asked Judge Aileen Cannon, who Trump appointed, to push the case until late November so the former president isn't stuck in a courtroom when he could be campaigning. Prosecutors responding this case can be tried this summer, accusing Trump of trying to wring out of the court needless hearings meant to delay. And they argued holding the trial before the vote would not violate the Justice Department's policy against bringing politically charged cases within 60 days of an election. They say that policy only applies to bringing an indictment. But in this case, a lengthy investigation is long complete and the charges laid out. So a trial can go forward. Prosecutors telling the judge we are in full compliance with the Justice Department manual. Judge Cannon did not issue a ruling today. In a Georgia courtroom, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who was prosecuting the former president for election interference, sitting silently. Trump's lawyer arguing she should be disqualified because of her romance with one of her prosecutors, Nathan Wade. Now, do you have to find that Wade and Willis lied? No. What you need to be able to find is that there is a concern, a legitimate concern based on the evidence in this case about their truthfulness. The district attorney's office arguing Willis's relationship with Wade did not infringe on Trump or his 18 co-defendants' rights to a fair trial. Not a single shred of evidence was produced <coughs> through any of the exhibits or the witness testimony showing how <coughs> their constitutional rights, their due process rights were all, were at all affected. 
Aaron joins us now from Florida. Aaron, what are the timelines on both of these cases? So, Phil, the judge in Atlanta said he would rule within the next two weeks. Here in Florida, Judge Cannon gave us no indication when she would set a new trial date for Donald Trump. But again, the prosecutors are arguing there is no need for her to wait until after the election because their investigation is long complete and holding a trial would not run afoul of Justice Department policy. Phil? We'll be waiting. Aaron Katursky, thank you. Now to a new discovery off the coast of Alaska, a fisherman finding debris and reporting it to the FBI. It could be another spy balloon. Let's go to Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas with new details. Tonight, the FBI investigating reports of another possible spy balloon flying in U.S. airspace. The FBI becoming involved after fishermen discovered a concerning object off the coast of Alaska. According to sources, the fishermen suspect it might be some kind of surveillance balloon. But tonight, the FBI is describing the unknown object as debris. Sources telling ABC News the FBI and other agencies will assess the object when it makes its way to shore this weekend, determining what, if anything, should be done next, including whether it will be flown to a government facility for further analysis. Just last week over Colorado, NORAD sending up fighter jets to intercept a high-altitude balloon flying at 43,000 to 45,000 feet. It was determined not to be a threat to national security, but President Biden and the White House tracking the balloon's course. The administration keenly aware of such incidents coming just a year after a Chinese spy balloon was spotted flying clear across the country. President Biden ordering it shot down off the coast of South Carolina. It's payload alone the size of three buses. Pierre joins me now. Pierre, why such a quick response to this? So you're seeing such a rapid response in part because of that massive Chinese spy balloon recovered last year, which we're told had expansive surveillance capabilities. These matters are now treated seriously until an assessment can be made one way or another, period, Phil. Yeah, absolutely no taking chances. Pierre Thomas, thanks. Pleasure. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny was laid to rest today in Moscow. It was an emotional scene, as you would imagine, inside the church, a traditional Orthodox service two weeks after Navalny's mysterious death at a remote Russian prison. Security forces obviously keeping a, a watchful eye. James Longman with our report. Tonight, they turned out by the thousands. <laughs> Russians braving Putin's security state to mourn opposition icon Alexei Navalny. You weren't afraid. We are not afraid either, they chanted, as Navalny's coffin arrived at this suburban Moscow church. Putin, Others in the crowd shouting, Putin is a killer, blaming the Russian leader for Navalny's death in an Arctic prison two weeks ago. The line around the block well over a mile long. And inside the church, Navalny's open casket, allowing mourners to say goodbye to the man whose ideals they hope they can keep alive. His parents looking on at their son, his body covered in roses. Later at the cemetery, his mother giving him a final kiss goodbye. The 47-year-old was buried to Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. And music from his favorite movie, Terminator 2, a last joke said to be typical of his humor. It was largely a peaceful day. At least 90 arrests reported so far at commemorations across the country. But Putin's eyes are everywhere in Russia, and recriminations may yet come. And tonight, in an emotional tribute, his wife Yulia posting, Thank you for 26 years of absolute happiness. I will try to make you proud. Our James Longman reporting tonight. Now to Gaza. President Biden announcing the U.S. will begin airdropping food and supplies into the Strip. It comes a day after that horrific scene, a deadly stampede, Israeli gunfire, as aid trucks were arriving. Tom Sufi Burridge is in the region for us tonight. Just 24 hours after the Israeli military opened fire amid a deadly crush of people desperate for food aid in Gaza, President Biden tonight announcing the U.S. will begin airdropping supplies into the Gaza Strip. People are so desperate that uh, uh, innocent people got caught in a terrible war, unable to feed their families, and you saw the response when they tried to get aid in. With half a million Gazans on the brink of famine, the U.N. saying at least 10 children have starved to death. Jordan and other countries already airdropping aid. The president's acknowledging not enough is getting in. Innocent lives are on the line and children's lives are on the line. Tonight, condemnation and calls for an investigation into what was supposed to be a humanitarian mission in northern Gaza. 
when more than 100 Palestinians were killed and hundreds more injured, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. This is the moment gunfire erupted. Israel says its troops fired warning shots and only opened fire on people when they got too close to one of their tanks, adding dozens of people were crushed to death in the chaos. But survivors and witnesses disputing that. Abdullah Juha recounting the horror, saying they attacked us, they shot at us. We don't have any food. And food, obviously, a top concern there right now. Tom joins us. Uh, Tom, how soon can these airdrops by the U.S. begin? Yeah, Phil, a U.S. official telling ABC News the humanitarian aid drops could start as soon as tomorrow, depending on weather conditions. President Biden saying the administration is also looking into ways to deliver aid by sea. Phil? Tom Sufi Burridge from Tel Aviv tonight. Tom, thank you. A massive life-threatening storm hitting California as we speak, then moving to Nevada and Colorado. Parts of the Sierra Nevada mountains expected to see an incredible 12 feet of snow. Winds gusting over 70 miles an hour. Even ski slopes are shutting down. Yosemite National Park also closing to visitors. And the rain torrential at lower elevations. Our Faith Abube is in Truckee, California. Tonight, rare blizzard warnings for the Sierra Nevada mountains as the biggest storm of the winter slams California with up to 12 feet of snow, life-threatening conditions and impossible travel in the mountains. Some of our highest peaks have seen winds in excess of 140 miles per hour, so this storm is just a monster. Officials in Truckee warning. We get a lot of snow. Uh, but we don't get blizzard conditions. We don't get conditions where if somebody were to walk out of their house down to the street, be completely disoriented and not know how to get back to their house. The worst of the conditions expected tonight through Saturday. Nightmarish travel already along Interstate 80 in Soda Springs. The Highway Patrol posting this video showing vehicles stuck in the whiteout over Donner Summit. The avalanche danger increasing with snowfall rates of up to five inches an hour. The high winds relentless. This is what officials were worried about. You can see the tree down on this house. Fortunately, though, no one was injured in this incident. Multiple ski resorts forced to close. The National Park Service even shutting down Yosemite to visitors. Faith Abube from Truckee, California. Faith, thank you. Meantime, there is an urgent search tonight for two people seen in a possible abduction near Phoenix, Arizona. Surveillance video from a gas station showing a woman leaving an SUV starting to run away. The driver then drags her back and drives away with her in the car. Police are asking for the public's help in finding both of them. Here's Kana Whitworth. Tonight, a desperate search for two people in this chilling video showing a possible abduction. A man grabbing a woman and forcing her into a car in Buckeye, Arizona. Police need the public's help. Help provide us with information so we can identify them and help and see if that woman is okay. You can see a car pull up to the gas pump. A woman gets out and starts running toward the store. The driver then drags her back and pushes her inside. The man then jumps into the car and speeds off. It is scary, you know, not knowing necessarily what their situation is. The surveillance video released nearly a week after it happened last Friday night at a Circle K gas station just off I-10 west of Phoenix. We don't know if these individuals were local. We don't know if they were just passing through Arizona on I-10. Police can't make out the license plate, but think it's a gray 2021-23 Nissan Rogue. Somebody who interacted with this vehicle maybe noticed something unique about it. Characteristics that we can't see in that Circle K video, but maybe can help us kind of narrow down. And Phil, right now authorities are saying they don't know if this was a domestic argument, but either way, their primary goal is to find this woman and make sure that she's okay. They're now hoping that people with nearby security cameras can help out. Also, Phil, at this point, the FBI has not yet been involved, but they are reaching out to other law enforcement agencies in the region to assist. Phil. All right, Kana, thank you. Walgreens and CVS say they will soon begin dispensing the abortion pill mifepristone in some states where it is legal. The move could make it easier for some patients to access the drug, which is the most common form of abortion in the U.S. The decision is directly tied to the new rules issued by the FDA for dispensing mifepristone, which are being challenged by anti-abortion groups before the Supreme Court. We turn now to the collision on a major bridge and then the heart-stopping rescue, a truck driver dangling off the Clark Memorial Bridge in Louisville, Kentucky. Here's Ariel Reshev. Tonight, those heart-pounding moments over the Ohio River. 
We're bringing you some breaking news right now. This is a picture of a truck hanging over the side of the Clark Memorial Bridge. It was just after noon when the Cisco 18 wheel tractor trailer and two other vehicles crashed on Louisville's Clark Memorial Bridge, sending the truck and the female driver inside dangling over the edge some 70 feet above the water. Louisville Fire's highly trained rescue team racing to the scene. Firefighter Bryce Carden lowered down to the cab of the truck, recalling the moment the driver first saw him through the truck's open window. Thank God. That's what she kept saying. Thank God. And I, I told her, I said, just take a deep breath. Firefighter Carden hooking her into his harness. The two of them slowly hoisted back up onto the bridge. She was praying a lot, so, uh, and I prayed with her. A delicate operation that took some 40 minutes to complete. All the credit goes to these folks right here. This was some really professional, well-practiced, well-trained stuff. Phil, officials are now inspecting the damage to that bridge, which will remain closed through tonight. Authorities say that the driver, who is a military veteran, remained incredibly calm, and she is okay tonight. Phil. Remarkable rescue. Ariel, thank you. There is so much more to get to tonight. Coming up, the country set to repeal a world's first law banning tobacco sales to future generations, despite serious warnings from researchers. But next, tackling a Shakespearean classic all on her own, I sit down with comedian, actor, and writer Eddie Izzard about her one-person show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families truck. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. I'm Rideya Villarreal in Houston, Texas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. The United Nations Human Rights Chief says the apparent deliberate denial of safe access for humanitarian agencies within war-torn Sudan could amount to a war crime. Aid supplies have been looted and humanitarian workers attacked, while international agencies and NGOs have complained about bureaucratic obstacles to get into the army-controlled hub of Port Sudan. Millions of people in the Darfur region are at risk of dying of hunger, according to an advocacy group. The High Commissioner for Human Rights says Sudan has become a, quote, living nightmare. The sharp spike in wildfires in Brazil is threatening indigenous people and reigniting fears of catastrophe in the Amazon rainforest. In just two months of 2024, the National Institute for Space Research identified 2,600 fires in the area. That is compared with 2,600 during all of 2023. New Zealand will appeal a world first law banning tobacco sales for future generations, even as researchers and campaigners warned that people could die as a result. 
Set to take effect in July, the toughest anti-tobacco rules in the world would have banned sales to those born after January 1st, 2009, cut nicotine content, smoke tobacco products, and reduce the number of tobacco retailers by more than 90%. The new coalition government elected in October confirmed the repeal will happen on Tuesday as a matter of urgency. She is a multi-talented comedian, actor, writer. Eddie Izzard has captivated audiences with her observational humor and range of skills for more than three decades. The impressions are really good, too. Think back to Ocean's 12, Ocean's 13, and her Emmy-winning comedy performance, Dressed to Kill. Eddie, who goes by pronouns she, her, is now back on the New York stage in William Shakespeare's Hamlet, but portraying all 23 characters by herself. You heard that right, so let's take a look. In my mind's eye, Horatio, he was a man, taken for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. Let the foils be brought. Man, I, I can't believe that you do that all on your own. Eddie, it is an honor to have you in studio. Thank you so much. You have done this off-Broadway uh, in, in London as well. Um, last year, playing all the roles in the adaptation of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Well, I'd say the technique I've done in, in London as well, but this, this Hamlet, this is, yeah, this is the first time that it's uh, been launched. I'm, like, I'm a crazy person, like a British person who launches in New York. Just because New York's got this uh, great feel about it, you know, just like open-minded, okay, you're trans, you're doing things, you came from comedy, but your first love was drama, you're going to play all the characters, let's see what you do. This is a sort of a, a New York thing, and so, yeah, it's been running very well. So why Hamlet? And, and why all by yourself? I've always thought I would like to push and uh, go to the, the most dramatic roles that I could do. Hamlet, maybe if someone looks at myself or looks at my track record, they might not have thought uh, I should be on the list for, let's give Hamlet to this person. Let's build a whole Hamlet around this person. I would imagine people ask you this question in doing this particular uh, piece that you're doing, but you identify as gender fluid. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one would think that might help in doing all of the characters? I, this is, this wasn't uh, something in my mind initially, but uh, I absolutely, as a, someone who feels I'm an, uh, identifies as a trans woman and I be, feel I am gender fluid, so giving honor to Ophelia and to Gertrude uh, as the female characters, as well as to Hamlet and to Claudius and Polonius, that is something I've pushed very strongly for. My director, Selena Cadell, wanted that very strongly as well. And uh, one person who came along in the Q&A afterwards, she said she's now, she, it's the first time that she's seen Ophelia and Hamlet as twin souls, which is a beautiful mm. thing. Um, so um, I, I feel I am doing honor to uh, all sexes in the, uh, in the play. You use the, use the whole theater, you use the aisles, wh wherever yes. you can, very physical, and w w we have to mention, it was 32 marathons in 31 days you did for charity? That was the last one. Um, I did, South Africa did 27 in 27 days as a salute to Nelson Mandela's 27 years in prison. Right. That was very outside, but during lockdown, I did it on a treadmill, 32 in 31 days. That um, is amazing. Yeah, well, it's just my determination. I mean, if you're... Um, I, I, I was given the determination gene, maybe, and I couldn't get my career going for a long time at the beginning, but I kept pushing away, kept pushing away. And then there's politics. Yes. You've run for parliament. Uh, two, I've done two primaries. Two primaries. primaries. And I haven't got in yet, came second in both, but I am a determined uh, person, so I will keep pushing until I get into parliament. Um, oh, wow. I want You're to help. I want to be positive. I'm, you know, I have a lot of energy. I'm very open-minded. I, I think a lot of people will be positive with me being a politician. Some people are very negative, but they tend to be of the extreme persuasions politically. And anyone who's kind of sensible thinks, well, you know, I've tried to do honorable things in my life mm. and do things in a positive way. Putting Hamlet on stage in English, performing in French and touring France in that language or in German uh, throughout Germany. These are positive things, mm. and I will try and bring all that all that energy to politics. So, is that next? Or we're going to do you're going to do that again? Well, yes, that is that is placed. That <laughs> we have a general things? election coming up sometime this year, and <laughs> I, I still haven't got a seat, but I'm still very positive on being an elected member in uh, for some constituency in the United Kingdom, and I will work very hard for that constituency. All right. Eddie Izzard, thanks so much. You can yeah. catch Hamlet at the Greenwich House Theater, although you're moving now, right? Moving to the Orpheum Theater. Moving to the Orpheum Theater uh, here in New York City. The run extended through April 14th.
And still to come, a dramatic way to enter the world from an ice storm to a fire station, one family's one of a kind birthing story is up next. Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary, yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. The Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Finally tonight, parents with a mom in labor forced to drive through snow and ice to get to the hospital, but they never made it. Instead, ending up in front of a fire station. Reporter Annie Kate from our partner station WBD, B, WBND in South Bend, Indiana, has the story. And it was probably about... 6 30 in the morning i texted my sister and i was like dude like something is wrong <laughs> she was like go to the hospital cassie elkins was in labor early january 20th but the hospital 10 minutes away from her plymouth home closed down its delivery services last year the next closest option saint joseph hospital in mishawaka at least 45 minutes further that was kind of in the middle of a not really a big snowstorm but it was very icy out and I'm doing like 80 miles an hour running red lights and I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to get you there. So I was in active labor. Well, now we know it was active labor at that point. Against the clock, through the tears, screams and icy conditions, she knew she couldn't wait the final 10 minutes of the drive to the hospital. And we were at an intersection right before the fire station. He was like, I see the baby, I see the baby and I can feel her head because I'm sitting there, you know. So I'm pushing and I couldn't stop pushing. I just, it felt right. <laughs> it hurts so bad. <laughs> but then he like goes over these little bumps and he's pulls into the fire station. This Mishawaka fire station on Union Street. Pulling the fire department, I'm honking the horn. Help, please help. He runs inside the station looking for help. And by the time they came out, I already had pulled her out. So. <laughs> you actually pulled her out? Yeah. Yeah, she was sitting like I was holding her when they came out. First responders loading up the new mom and baby in an ambulance, finally finishing their journey to the hospital. Priscilla, one month old, is doing just fine. But the new parents are well aware so many things could have gone wrong that day. It's scary because you don't know how your baby's going to be born. You don't know if they're going to have a cord around their neck or if they're not going to be breathing. People have babies every single day. There's always babies being born. There are. What a way to come into the world. Priscilla is beautiful, and we thank Annie Kate from our partner station, WBND in South Bend. That's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Have a good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of